Thanks so much for, for coming, everybody. It's, it's been a while since I gave a talk here. I remember in the beginning, I gave like talk every meetup. But uh, yeah, so I'm going to speak about Cosmos today uh, and about the kind of different components of Cosmos, the thesis behind Cosmos, and some of the, how it works underneath. Now, this talk is called Many Chains, Many Tokens, One Ecosystem, which is kind of a description of this Internet of Blockchain vision that Cosmos has. Now, I must say that I have uh, plagiarized this talk. And then the original author is, is a guy named Sonny. He's also the self-declared czar of Bitcoin Cash, and uh, he, as, as you can see here. And he's been working at Tendermint as a researcher for a while, and uh, he's, he's first came up with this excellent talk, which I've only slightly modified. Uh, yeah, so probably most of you, or some of you know me, so I've been around this space for a while. So did this meetup group like four years ago and uh, also run the Epicenter podcast. And then I was working 2015, 16 for a company called Monax. Now Monax is actually building on top of Tendermint. And, uh, and then since January, I've been working for Tendermint and Cosmos. And some of you may know, we did a fundraiser in, uh, in April to, to raise money to build out Cosmos. And so that's what I've been working on since then. And uh, next year, I'm actually are going to start working, or, or we have started working on, on running a, a validator for Cosmos. So I'm, I'm going to leave the company now that's kind of building out Cosmos to run a validator in the network. Yeah, so there's two, two projects here that we should talk about. First is Tendermint, the second is Cosmos. So Tendermint is a much older project. Um, and Tendermint really comes from a kind of a different approach to building blockchain applications. So traditionally, the way blockchain applications have been built is by having kind of one software code base that is you know, the entire thing. So that includes basically the networking, so the peer-to-peer -peer things of like sending around blocks and data and the mempool and things like that. Then the consensus rules, so what are the rules for producing the next block? And finally, the application. So you know, with Bitcoin, very famously, it is one massive code base. It's very, very hard to change because they're all kind of interwoven, not clearly separated. And, and even with Ethereum, right, it's still one code base. So this is kind of how uh, blockchain architecture has traditionally worked. Um, now with Ethereum, now the problem with this architecture is, so if you want to like build an application on top, you have to like go deep into the sort of machinery of, of this thing. And, and make changes to it. So that's why it's very, very hard to build things on top of Bitcoin. Uh, so you had these kind of clunky efforts like counterparty or colored coins to, to do things on top of Bitcoin. And of course, it didn't really work. And also, if one forked Bitcoin to do a new project, that's very difficult too. Or even just to write another a client that's compatible with Bitcoin so that you don't accidentally fork, that's very hard, right? So today, this... Uh, Bitcoin Core, which is basically run by all the mining hardware is run on that. So still there's only really one uh, implementation of Bitcoin. And that has a lot to do with, with this and how this is built. And of course, they came to Ethereum. And Ethereum tried to solve this problem to some extent by basically saying that the application uh, isn't you know, this limited thing anymore, but that the application itself becomes a virtual machine that you can then run uh, full scripts on top. So this is basically the Ethereum stack. So you still have networking consensus and the, and the version machine or the, the application here as part of one code base, but you can then write these true and complete applications on top of that. And of course, this was a, a, a very good idea and a brilliant idea, and it led to tons of innovation and progress and, uh, and yeah, a whole ecosystem around that. But there are some problems with this. One is that as an application developer, you have no control. You can't really change anything underneath. So you can't change consensus and networking, but you also can't change the VM. So you can't really write applications in anything that doesn't compile into the kind of EVM bytecode. So basically, Solidity and Serpent. I don't know what the latest other languages the theorem has. Um, so it's very limited in that way. Um, you know, it has its advantages, right? Interoperability is one. It's easy to develop stuff, uh, but it's it's limiting. The performance is terrible, and um, 
Yeah, so the Tenement has a different approach. So Tenement, the, the, one of the core ideas of Tenement was to, to separate those and Tenement uh, and to have networking and consensus, which is Tenement core, and then have basically like an API interface, which is called ABCI, which is the application blockchain interface, yes. Uh, so that you can write your application on top that basically uses like an API to get data and write data from the consensus and the blockchain layer. So this way you have like a clean separation that if you write an application, you don't have to care really about the underlying stuff. Uh, and there's some other reasons also why you don't have to care about the underlying stuff. Uh, and yeah, you can, you can kind of cleanly separate that. And, <laughs> and yeah, so that's, that's kind of, uh, how Tenement is, is architected at this point. So you have applications on top, you have the, the networking consensus. The networking consensus is this, uh, well, yeah, consensus, uh, maybe you can speak a little bit more about. So the consensus, the Tenement consensus was started in 2014, work on that, and it was inspired by the whole literature around Byzantine fault tolerant algorithms. So there are academic papers on that starting in the 80s. And uh, Tenement basically, or, or Jay back then, you know, he looked at the, the proof of work and, and some other efforts and said, okay, this is not very efficient. Can't we use some of this research that was originally done, adapt that for a blockchain environment, and then reach or, or basically build consensus engines like that? So Tenement's been around now for, I guess, sort of four years soon, uh, so quite a long time. Uh, and, and this is the fundamental idea of Tenement. Now, Tenement is very suitable for both public and private chains. Well, for private chains, it's been used for, for a while as well, you know, at least in, in this whole POC environment that all these private projects uh, are at at this point. Um, and for the public chains, well, this is what, what we're now working on with Cosmos. Now, Tenement works basically like this. So you have different validators. The validators have different weights based on how many tokens they have. So let's say we can assume, let's say there's 10 validators, they all have 10% of the tokens. They all have basically equal uh, weight in, in, uh, in voting. Now some, the block gets proposed, it gets passed around, uh, people or the validators vote in that block. And as soon as more than two thirds have basically voted yes, this block is fine, this looks good, it's, it's committed and it's finalized. So this also means that uh, every block is, you, you know, we can lie on it. You know that this is the, the real block. There's not going to be another block. Uh, we don't have to like wait for a bunch of confirmations to make sure that this doesn't get like rolled back. Uh, it's also very scalable. So Tendermint can do, I think something like maybe 10,000 transactions per second. Uh, and the block times are like one to three seconds with, you know, I think 100 validators across all continents, things like that. And it has also inspired a lot some other you know work in proof of stake, in particular Casper, is uh, is based to some extent on on Tenement. But yeah, so a little bit more about this finality and forking thing. So of course with Bitcoin, right, you have this idea that the longest chain is the most secure chain, and thus is the kind of true chain. And this means that you can have multiple chains at the same height. And if you want to have security, it means you have to wait for some confirmations. So the problem with this is there's a bunch of problems. Of course, there's the huge energy efficiency, inefficiency, which is one problem. But another problem is that if you write an application, then you have to kind of wait, or you have to be somewhat aware of the consensus and have to take that into account when you design your applications. With Bitcoin, that's like comparatively simple because the applications are simple. It's basically sending money around, right? So where, where do you have this in reality, right? You have like, let's say an exchange or payment processor says, okay, we have to wait six confirmations to like talk to some nodes, see, see how many block deep it is. And then they say, okay, we now we can update the state. But of course, if you talk about Ethereum, it gets much, much worse because you have many more blocks. So you have many more of these uh, forks and then the application state becomes much more complicated because if you say okay now we're gonna like show some other thing on the interface and some prediction market thing takes place rolling that back is like a total nightmare so this is also one of the core ideas of Tenement that this is unacceptable and the idea that application developers 
are basically going to have to think through like forking logic and incorporate that in their user interface and rollbacks and all of that stuff is completely impractical. And that for that reason, blocks being final is really, really uh, crucial. So that's also one of the key, one of the key benefits of Tenement. Um, yeah, so what can you do with Tenement? Of course, because it's very flexible, you can build a lot of different things. And again, because you have this basically API and afterwards you can write your application on top, well, one of the applications that you can put there is just the EVM, right? So basically, if you have this here, you have Tenement consensus or the Tenement core, and then you have the EVM running on top and using ABCI to speak with the consensus layer. And this is a project called Ethermint. So then if you have an uh, Ethereum application, you can just take that same application and put it on Ethermint, and it will run basically exactly the same way. Of course, the, the big difference being that uh, the blocks are maybe one, every one to two or three seconds. It depends a little bit on the, how the network's set up instead of every 15 seconds. And in terms of scalability, it will be maybe 20 times as, as much throughput. And, and then there's the finality aspect as well. So this is kind of one, one thing you can do. But of course, you can have other, other types of applications too. Um, <clears throat> in particular, most of the Cosmos stuff is not written on the EVM and doesn't use that thing. But it uses uh, another thing called Cosmos SDK, which is basically like a cryptocurrency framework written in Go. And then there's this concept of kind of plugins too, so that the Cosmos SDK is kind of modular as well, and that you can have different kind of components that you can just sort of plug in there. Uh, governance being one of them, uh, but there could be a, there are other ones too. So now we kind of get to the Cosmos ecosystem and what that looks like. So the Cosmos ecosystem is basically a whole set of blockchains that are all running tandem and core. Now they could be running something else too. Uh, but I, the key thing here is that blockchains in the Cosmos ecosystems kind of have to get to a point where, where there's finality, you know, where they actually can say, okay, this block we can rely on. And, and those blockchains are then interconnected using something called IBC. So IBC is the Inter-Blockchain Communication Protocol. Now, the nice thing about Tandem 2 is that you can have very powerful light proofs. So light proofs, some are probably aware, you know, there's things like a Bitcoin light client, something like Electrum, right, that you can run on your computer and it can verify the Bitcoin blockchain without having to have a f run a full node. So it doesn't have to get like all the blocks and all the data, but you can still be like very, very certain that when you get this information, I've received the payment, it's actually accurate and it can't be fraudulent. So Bitcoin has these SPV Clients. Now, the nice thing in Tenement is that you can do very, very efficient uh, light client proofs. In particular, you can have one blockchain be a light client of the other blockchain. So they can both be light clients of each other, and they can thus verify you know, transactions on the other chain. So what this makes possible is that one chain, that you can basically move tokens from one chain to another or move data from one chain to another. And there's this protocol called IBC, which, which does that. Well, it's actually a pretty simple uh, protocol. So, <clears throat> so then you have this network of interconnected blockchains. In the, in the middle, of the, the kind of first one we'll launch with is this thing called Cosmos Hub. And the, Cosmo, the idea of the Cosmos Hub is basically that for this to be most efficient, is the Cosmos Hub is going to be a light client and verify like all the other blockchains in the Cosmos ecosystem. And so it, it almost works a little bit like it can route tokens and data throughout the ecosystem. So if, you know, if, if this chain wants to talk to this chain, it doesn't have to have a direct connection. You can just sort of route it through the Cosmos Hub. And um, that also prevents kind of double spending, right? Because the Cosmos Hub can kind of keep track. OK, you know, how many tokens have been created here? And how many have been moved in here? And, and then how many are in other zones? So it can all kind of be, be kept track of in the Cosmos Hub. And now the nice thing is you can have all kinds of different blockchains connected to that. So you can have something like Ethermint connected to that. So that means you could have a blockchain that is just like Ethereum, right, where you can have all kinds of Ethereum applications in. And let's say if people ha have today 
uh, application that they're trying to deploy on Ethereum, but it doesn't run or it's too expensive. They could just take the same application and also deploy it here, so it runs on both chains. And you know, maybe there's some way in the UI uh, that people can choose which chain they want to run it on. And of course, there's no reason why there just has to be one of these Ethereum chains. There could be five or ten all running in parallel, all connected to Cosmos Hub. And if you have something like that, let's say you have ten of these Ethereum zones connected to the Cosmos Hub, and each of those has like 200 transactions a second. Well, then you had 2,000 transactions a second, and Ethereum today has like 15, right? So we had like 100, more than 100x uh, improvement. So if you if you look at all the scalability issues that we have in Ethereum today, well, if this is launched and there's Ethereum in zones and they work, they're kind of solved for the time being. Um, now, what you can also have is you can have chains in this Cosmos ecosystem that are application specific, right? So let's say someone wants to do a prediction market. Well, prediction market is going to have like lots of transactions, right? But they're mostly like internal to that market, right? There are people putting on trades and those trades getting settled, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, well, a project like that could create their own chain. And of course, that has a lot of benefits too, because then you can also get rid of the EVM potentially and build these kind of customized chains around what the use case and the requirements are. Um, yeah, and then there's other things. Uh, well, in particular, one thing that's interesting is uh, connecting to private chains, because you can have a private chain running there where you can't see the data, right? So it can be part of the Cosmos ecosystem but still you cannot see the data in here. You only know, okay, we have these validators that are basically running that chain and they can write data onto Tenement Core. So for, for example, you could have like a consortium chain here that's I issuing like energy credit or something like that. And they're then, uh, you know, they underneath in this consortium are using this blockchain to make sure that the, the credits and the data, et cetera, is managed correctly and then they can basically issue assets on, on the Cosmos Hub, or, and it can be tracked there. And so as, as a user, I will know that, OK, all this asset that's coming there, it has been signed by you know, all these companies that are verifying this chain. You know that you can have transparency on the supply, et cetera, without being uh, exposed, or without the, the kind of business logic and, and potentially privacy sensitive data on the private chain being exposed. So I think that's also interesting. Um, and hopefully we'll see lots of that. Now to connect with existing blockchains can be a little bit more difficult um, because those often are proof of work based like Ethereum or Bitcoin. And then you have the problem that there's no finality in the chain. So with IBC, you kind of rely on this concept of finality so that you know this can't be undone. Because if it can be undone, it gets like a, it becomes a mess, right? Because then you have like double spends in Cosmos, and it's it's a mess. So you don't want that. So one solution to this is having basically these kind of peg zones. So these peg zones would then be run by validators that are you know validating the Ethereum chain at the same time as they are running the validators on this Tenement chain. And so they can say, okay, if it's enough confirmations deep we say it's like quasi-final. And then let's say, so Ethereum could be put into some smart contract here. Uh, you wait on to, for enough confirmation that you're sure that, OK, this Ether is actually in that contract. It's not going to be like double spent. And then those signers could basically issue uh, Ethereum tokens on the Cosmos hub. And, and you know this e e Ethereum is frozen here. So you have like fully backed Ether on Cosmos. So it would be equivalent, really, with Ether. You know, it should be exactly the same value. And you could then use it to pay for transaction fees or for anything you want. And then if somebody wants to take it back, they basically you know, send that money back to um, the Cosmos hub, that contract there. It gets destroyed. And then this will get released over here. So there be actually there is a, this. So there's been a Cosmos hackathon going on for a while. And we had like this high school kid from Korea who uh, won one of the hackathons by writing the IBC verification as an Ethereum smart contract. So he's like, pretty cool.
Um, yeah, so what, what, what are the advantages of this? Well, one thing here, uh, first of all, there's the aspect of the diversity, right? So you can have lots of different blockchains with different characteristics, different features, different version machines written in different languages. They can all like coexist and, and work and function in Cosmos ecosystem. You can also have privacy, right? So you, you could have, I mean, potentially you can have privacy zones like a Zcash zone and things like that, but you can also have private chains and they're all connected and you know, should work pretty well. And then of course, scalability is one of the core features. I mean, this is kind of a boring way to scale, right? It's not as fancy as like Plasma or Lightning Network, or all these sharding, all these very complicated ways, but it's very feasible, right? It's clear how this works. All of the components basically are there and there's maybe some final work that has to be done, but this isn't like years away like most of the other uh, scalability efforts or like the ones we see in Ethereum, for example. Um, you also have security, right? Because the, well, first of all, you have a bond and proof of stake, right? So uh, you have validators put up security deposits, they get slashed if they do something wrong. So from a game theoretic perspective, like this is much more secure than uh, proof of work, or at least it should be. Um, and then I think the last thing is also very important, like sovereignty. So when you have this here, like each of these chains could have its own validator set. Uh, and so you can have different communities that are managing their own chain. Now in particular, right, if you have an application chain, let's say Gnosis did a, call, uh, a zone here, uh, then they could have their own token holders uh, basically putting up security deposits and, and validating that chain. And, and I think that's fantastic, right? Because it means that they all of a sudden gain control of the, of the full platform. So if they need to make changes to the, to the uh, underlying architecture, they can do so. And you don't really have those conflict of interest anymore that you know, is a huge problem for Ethereum, right? With Ethereum Classic and, and you know, if you think back to the DAO, then you had this big problem because you had all these DAO holders and they got their money lost, so they wanted to like reverse that. But then you had the other Ethereum holders who were like, well, this is not our problem. We don't want to roll back the chain. We would promise this was immutable and code is law and now you guys want to change that. So you have a conflict of interest and well, it's understandable, right? Because you have different groups of uh, stakeholders living on the same network and now, well, their interests are going to collide and they somehow have to battle this out and it's kind of a mess. So the idea of having many different uh, zones or blockchains that have their own sovereignty, their own communities, their own governance system, and they all can all interoperate, I think is a very uh, important one and hopefully there's, I mean, this is absolutely required. Um, yeah, so we, just briefly on scalability, I mean, we, we've kind of talked about this already, but you know, there's two ways, uh, you can think of two ways of scaling. One is to say this idea of like vertical scalability, so you have one blockchain, you try to make that much more performant. So of course, proof of stake is one thing. Proof of stake already uh, is a big improvement over proof of work and probably gives something like, I don't know, 50, 100x or something like that uh, improvement. There's other things like state channels, fancy things like recursive snark, I don't understand. Uh, but of course the other thing is horizontal scalability, just like putting chains next to each other. Now, as we are seeing with proof of work, it does not work, you cannot do this. Like now we have in Bitcoin, right, we have in a way horizontal scalability. We have like Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash and stuff like that. But what problems does it lead to? Right now one of them gets more expen expensive, the miners switch to that, and the block times gets longer, and then they switch back there, it's a complete mess. So you can't, it's impossible to have horizontal scaling in proof of work chains. But you know, here in Cosmos, this is straightforward and easy. Um, yeah, and, and especially application-based uh, kind of, you know, you can call it sharding, or basically applications have their own blockchains is, uh, is very good. And that also means that if you care about a particular application, well, you just run the node for that chain where that application lives. But of course, in Ethereum today, you care about Golem or something. Well, you have to still, if you want to run a full node, verify all these other applications that you don't care about, you never use. Um, and that makes it very expensive to run a full node as well. 
Um, let me see. Yeah, and, uh, and here we can also have, um, so application specific chains really means that you can kind of custom build the chain around the application. So some of them will, you know, will look very, very different. I mean, the idea of a Turing complete chain, it makes a lot of sense for experimentation, for POC, because you can quickly build something new and you don't have to make deep changes. But if it comes to the point where you actually want to like go into production and you're going to have a lot of users, then performance and scalability, you know, as we are seeing today, becomes super important. And then these uh, Turing complete EVM chains don't make a lot of sense. But then it may mu make much more sense that you have 10 or 20 or however many uh, kind of like Bitcoin, like opcodes for the features that that chain needs. And, and then you could do that. And of course, with governance and having votes on that, you can then still update that chain. And, and of course, again, with Bitcoin, we have the problem that even though it's a pretty efficient system for what it can do, you don't have an upgrade process, right? So it's not flexible. But that's because there's no governance in Bitcoin. If there was governance in Bitcoin, I'm sure we wouldn't have had years of fighting uh, and there would have been upgrades much earlier. It also re it uses a tax surface because, of course, uh, having Turing complete chains makes also uh, for lots of vulnerabilities, as we have seen recently again with the the parity multi-sig thing, and and those kind of things are almost unavoidable with with Ethereum chains. But if you have application-specific chains. Uh, you also don't really have that problem. Um, and yeah, I mean, IBC really is, you, you can think of it as, as the original sidechains concept that you know, was advanced by uh, Blockstream years ago. Of course, the big difference is that the, the sidechains concept that Blockstream had was dependent or vetted to this proof of work concept. And that doesn't really make a lot of sense because the security of those side chains would get very, very low unless you got all the miners to basically validate all the side chains. But even then, because they don't, there's no security deposit, you can't punish them if they do something wrong. So the side chains concept back then was really flawed. But with proof of stake uh, and this easy way to verify that we have in Cosmos, the side chain concept actually becomes super possible. Um, and yeah, and this is not just, it's also a very different thing from a token swap, right? There are often people have probably heard from atomic swaps. So the idea that, okay, let's say I, I can send some Bitcoin to you on the Bitcoin chain and you send some, uh, some Litecoin to me on the Litecoin chain and we can make sure that, you know, both of those complete without having to trust a third party and, and so we can basically trade sort of. But this is not the same thing here, right? Here you can actually like move the token over. So you have an Ether before, you still have an Ether, except that Ether has been transferred basically to a Cosmos hub or a Cosmos zone. Um, and yeah, I think sovereignty is just another example here why this is key. If you think of Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, I mean, if you move to a proof of stake world, like, it doesn't make any sense that they would have the same validator set. They have different philosophies, different communities, different interests. So they should have different validator sets. So again, I think that just points to the necessity of having uh, a kind of internet of blockchains world where you can have sovereign chains. So I think this is also a contrast to Polkadot because people often ask about that. So in Polkadot, you basically have like this one overarching validator set and security base that's running many chains in parallel, which of course is very cool too, but it doesn't ha give the individual chains the sovereignty. Um, yeah, as you can see, Sonny is a fan of Lieberland. Uh, yeah, so that is basically it. Um, the basic Cosmos vision is that we can have a, in, a whole ecosystem of interacting blockchains that are you know, highly, highly efficient, where we can have tokens that are able to move between chains so that you can hopefully in the future do something like you know, use Bitcoins to pay for smart contract execution elsewhere. And you know, I think decoupling Bitcoin from the Bitcoin network would actually also be a huge thing. Of course, with Bitcoin, it's hard to do this whole peg zone 
that is a very difficult thing to do because of the limitations of Bitcoin. But hopefully it will be possible at some point. And of course, it will be amazing if we could actually move the Bitcoins away there and use in a more scalable way. And, and maybe that would also solve some of the problems in, in the Bitcoin universe and some of the disagreements there. Um, yeah, I think, well, there's this wonderful picture, as you can see here, lots of coins living happily next to each other, like in a beautiful rainbow, uh, which is basically the idea of this whole thing. So yeah, if you have some questions, we can do that. Sure. So the question is, uh, if I understand it correctly, so if you want to do more than just moving tokens between chains, but you actually want to like call contracts and applications between chains. So this is uh, not something we're working on because it's just uh, much more complex, right? So I think it's important to get like this right first. In print, but afterwards, absolutely, I think it's something that you know at some point we will try to do as well. Um, yeah, I think this is one of the reasons, right? So Cosmos is, is planning, you know, we're anticipating a launch uh, soon, right, in a few months. And if you look at Polkadot, right, which is trying to do that, uh, well, they're planning a launch in, like... 2019. Yeah, 2019, right? So two years, right? So I think that is one of the key reasons, exactly, because it's this really, really hard thing. Um, now, that being said, if, if they figure it out, then it, there's no reason why it wouldn't work here as well. Uh, or at some point, I think, when, when this is working and this is working well, then this is also something that can be tackled. I think one thing that is possible, I mean, it's not the full contract calls across chains, but it's basically like uh, that you kind of verify data across chains. So that, I think, is also fairly simple. No, no, the verification of the proofs happens like in the blockchain, right? So you basically uh, have a proof, right? So let's say you, you move some data in there, in this IBC, there's like an outbox kind of, like an email outbox or something, and then you have a proof, okay, it's in there, it has been signed by all the validators of that chain, and then I, I can basically put this proof over here. Now, here you know that uh, we have a proof that was signed by the validators here. We also, it, the hub also keeps track of the validator sets of these different chains. So the hub knows, okay, this is the current validator set that has signed this. Uh, and so then you, you know that this data is coming from there and it is authentic and it has been signed by them. It's not the full like calling applications across chains. Like that will not be possible with Cosmos uh, in the foreseeable future. Yeah, at some, at some point, sure. But I, to be honest, I'm not, uh, take, I don't understand the, how, I haven't spent time thinking about how contract calls will work across chains. So I, I, I'm not a developer either. So I'm not the right person to ask about this. Uh, I mean, both. Uh, I would say the, the first focus is to launch the Cosmos Hub. Uh, and then I think there will be some chains that are, you know, also new chains. In particular, the Ethermint chain is the most important one, where you have like, a chain where you can run Ethereum applications. Uh, and then I think the uh, peg to the Ethereum network as well is, is, is kind of a high priority, and that's going to happen pretty soon. Uh, other things like pegging the Bitcoin, I think that's uh, much harder and it, that is not something we're working on at this point. I mean, if somebody like Rootstock or others, I mean, I think there are a bunch of projects that are trying to do this and if they figure it out, we could also just copy that 
Um, but yeah, I think initially the hub, uh, Ethermint, um, there are a few projects that are kind of working on developing their own zones, the own Cosmos zones as well. We've also had conversations with different, or there are some projects thinking about uh, kind of developing their own application specific zones. So hopefully that's also something we'll see pretty soon. So if I want to start writing an app using the API interface tomorrow, <coughs> where can I start, where can I find documentation on that topic? Yeah, yeah, so the question is how can you start writing ABCI app? So uh, just Google Tenement ABCI and there's like documentation and, uh, and there's also the Cosmos SDK, which is this kind of, which is being used for the, the Cosmos hub. So this is cryptocurrency framework in Go. Um, yeah, so we can start using that. And uh, yeah. Cool, so somebody has more question? Do one more? All right, cool. Then thanks so much.